So here to give us an insight on the health of the mining sector and share the buy side view on some of the challenges investing in mining projects around the world, it's my pleasure to introduce Char Mallon, who's Portfolio Manager at Vanek, Kaylee Barker, Director of Natural Resources at BlackRock, Jessica Fung, Vice President at Parla Investments, and Ross Allister, Head of Mining Investment Banking at Kill Hunt. A warm welcome to the panel. Thank you all for joining me today. So um, it's been an exceptional year of change on many levels. Um, on the macro side, we seem to be seeing many factors to consider influential over the business of mining. Um, so we're very curious to ask the panel, um, how do they see the health of the mining industry at present? Um, Jessica, you head Parler's macro and commodity research, um, as well as other functions. Um, taking this through a private equity lens, could you give us a sort of big picture view of the health of the mining, mining sector from Parler at the moment? Yeah, so I have to say, you know, while GDP numbers suggest that we're going through a recession technically, um, this is very, very different than 10 years ago. Um, you know, asset prices came back relatively quickly. Um, I was just taking a look at the copper chart earlier today. So during the GFC, for example, copper prices, you know, bottomed at about a dollar forty. It took three months to get there, by the way, down to a dollar forty, and then a full year to really recover. This time around, within a month, we were down to two ten, and then we bounced right back out of that. And within three months, we were back to pre-pandemic copper prices. So this time around, for I think the mining sector, it it wasn't as difficult. Um, you know, as as all my other panelists know, balance sheets much healthier this time around. Appetite uh, to sort of buy that very very shallow dip, very very strong. Uh, a lot of appetite, especially on anything related to green. And so, from a PE perspective, you know, we we sat here and we said, okay, let's wait for the opportunity. And it almost feels like it didn't come. We didn't have that situation. Uh, where we saw a whole lot of distressed assets. So it just hasn't materialized to the same extent, which I think is a good sign for the, for the mining industry in, in general, in terms of where they stand. But it's uh, from a PE perspective, you know, it, it wasn't, it was, we didn't see the opportunities maybe we were thinking we would see uh, when this all kicked off earlier this year. Yep, certainly. Um, but did, uh, is there still value from a PE perspective in the market right now? Is, is there um, still... Um you know, it might not have been as many distressed assets to come in and look at uh, flipping around, but do you still see um, value in the overall market? There are po pockets of value, I will say. Um, but, you know, to be honest, they can be quite far and few between. So certainly I'm not taking, I'm not looking at this through a public equities lens. Um, we're looking much more at, you know, single assets and projects and, and particularly leverage to the green thematic. And so there are pockets of, of value, but I have to say, you know, in, investors have been quite keen to jump into the same space, a very, very crowded space that we're in. Um, so we're still looking around for, for that opportunity, for that really special opportunity, but, but we can be patient as well. Yep, certainly. Charles, um, I'd like to bring you in. What's, uh, what's the view from Van Eck? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things we can talk about. <clears throat> On the commodity side, without a question, I think the the mining mining commodities are all looking relatively positive. Um, you know, in the medium to longer term, there might be some shorter term concerns that we might have, whether it's copper or gold or things like that. And I think that's more um, specific to financial <clears throat> instruments and financial markets than the underlying fundamentals of the of a commodity, meaning supply and demand, right? Um, on the equity side, <clears throat> sorry, Jessica alluded to this when she when she spoke about the the, the debt restructuring or the debt of these companies, and um, we've we've been talking and 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 pushing not only the mining companies but the whole natural resources environment to sort of refocus on how they allocate capital. Um, and for you guys um, follow the space closely, we're known since about 2013, maybe 2015. There's been this push from away from being big <clears throat> to a push to being profitable. So let's explore a mine for being, being uh, profitable, have margins. Uh, we can talk a little more about that later on, but I think that thematic theme for us is a very critical theme uh, for companies that has, has the ability to 
to return cash to shareholders and make, make sure that the balance sheets are strong. Now, obviously, there's more exploration companies and develop com development companies that don't actually have that type of ability. But for them, it comes down to more similar to what Jessica said, project specific issues that we would be looking at uh, as catalysts. Yeah. So am I right in saying, perhaps, Charles, that the, the, sort of the, the macro overlay isn't too important right now in terms of it's about what the companies are doing themselves on a case by case basis or a project by project basis. And that in itself could be quite fragmented. I would say, I think short term, <clears throat> the macroeconomic um, fundamentals, whether it's monetary policy or fiscal policy, is going to drive things. And with that, and, and then obviously, <clears throat> we just had an election here in the United States. So I think for the next quarter or two, maybe that drives it, um, at least as, as uh, it drives at least and spikes up or spikes down. But I think if you look, you know, we typically look at a two year uh, time frame for investing. So I think if you can look through that, like we do on a two year time frame, it comes very much down to company specific fundamental catalysts that we can invest in. You know, and I always, when I meet with the companies, I'm sure everybody else does the same thing. The sort of first question I ask the, the management is, how are you going to create value over the next 12 months? And, and the answer can't be the commodity price is going up. It has to be company specific things that I can hang my hat on, bite my teeth in whichever acronym or uh, you want to use. But I'm looking for company specific fundamental drivers that I can invest in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll come into some of perhaps some of those drivers uh, later on. That's great. Uh, Kaylee, could I um, bring you in here and ask? Um, your, your views initially, and would you like to comment on any of the points um, that Charles and Jessica have raised? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Adam. I th yeah, I mean, it's, I, th I think um, Jessica and Charles have covered a, a lot of it. I think what we're watching closely on the macro side really is obviously the US, how the US dollar is going to perform, as, as, especially against real rates. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a large prospect that we're in this over indebted society inflation expectations are sort of probably going to come back and that should be a positive environment for all commodities i suppose the counter argument to that is and we've seen this to some degree the yields are coming back um again and if that does put you know maybe there's some rate increases in the not too distant future Pro probably not of a big degree but just enough to satisfy the macroeconomists and if that's the case then you know that's going to put pressure on the commodities and and probably more so on gold than the others so i think that's the sort of things we're we're watching closely we're at this stage pretty constructive i feel um for the mining companies themselves yes all in absolute rude health we're very pleased to see companies in fantastic shape you know the best shape I, i've ever seen in in my years in the industry um and even even gold companies now on a fight for dividend so you know this harks back to the sort of well even before my time in the industry you know the 80s as the south african gold industry 80s and 90s when um when they were paying very healthy yields so if they if if they can pay dividend yields i guess into the order of what the, the bigger mining companies are doing like six or seven percent probably a bit too much of a stretch but uh that that all just creates a fantastic health amongst the industry um also excited very excited and i'm sure we'll come on to this very excited to see expiration back in favor um, you know, there's been a rotation into some of the more mid caps and junior space, which is pleasing to see that side investment coming back into that side of our sector. Um, the challenge we always have is, I, I think, fast markets, you know, very volatile markets, um, fighting for people's attention, <laughs> particularly when other sectors are, are doing so well. And, and, and the world is moving from one um one crisis to the next so it, it, it's it makes a fantastically interesting uh, scenario for all of us yep certainly some very positive uh points there does does that clearly then are you seeing more of an in institutional interest then 
or uh, some more big pension fund money perhaps looking at mining and saying, look, we need to make more exposure to this, uh, this industry um, because of its good performance, because of the rude health that you mentioned that some of the companies are in now versus what they have been. I, th I think you have to separate the industry into two distinct, maybe even three distinct buckets, really. F firstly, traditional mining. Um, secondly, gold. And then thirdly, let's call it sustainable mining or new mining or green mining, whatever you want to call it. So I think the latter two we're seeing more interest in. Gold, obviously, the, the, it's doing its job as a safe haven. So there's obvious interest there. Um, green mining, sustainable mining, thematics, you know, that's a big part of our team's expansion. We've, we've you know, natural resources and thematics, we have all kinds of funds in that space. So we're seeing lots of interest in that. I think traditional mining will be more challenged and, and perhaps just like in the energy industry, the big miners are going to have to sort of pull their socks up in some regards just to gain attention over the generalist investor who's more interested in, into those thematics or seeing better growth winning over sort of value in other sectors like technology. Um, so that, that, that's definitely a strain, but we'll, I, I suspect we'll see those trends continue regardless what plays out over the course of the next year. Yeah, I, absolutely. Okay. Um, Ross, could, could I bring you in here? Great to have you with us. Um, we know that Peel Hunt's uh, had a really good year, um, top Extel rated. Uh, analyst house uh, again um, really good to have you on uh, involved in one-to-one -one this time around um, presumably you can come from this from a london-centric view uh, what's your take on the overall health of industry yeah absolutely i think i'll come at it from uh, probably a, a more london-centric and probably more uk generalist perspective because that's um, the majority of our client base but i think I think I'd probably echo what everyone else has said. Really, we are in a fairly good place, I think, um, in terms of commodity prices at the moment and in terms of the outlook for those commodity prices. Um, and broadly speaking, we are seeing an increase in institutional interest um, from those generalists in, in the sector. I would temper that somewhat. I mean, it's been a schizophrenic market for the last month or so never mind uh, 2020 as a whole in terms of the u.s election in terms of the vaccine news so i think we kind of let it yet to see things properly kind of even out but even in the last few weeks we are seeing more interest there's probably a general pivot in the market towards value investing i think there's a lot of value to be had in in the sector um and i think the generalist approach is so that they, they will look at um companies uh, that have exposure to commodities where there's momentum and, and i think that's not been the case for the last however long um but is now and so i think you will see a, an uptick in interest um I, I, I would temper that as well but just by saying that those generalist fund managers are, are benchmark versus uh indices like the FTSE all share and, and they can't have too much of an overweighting to the sector so you're not going to see people kind of jump in and at the same time, I think we've been perceived as a as a riskier sector um, for for people to put money into for for a number of years. So those generalists who have probably a higher risk threshold will will obviously bear that in mind and um, probably dip their toes in the water if they've not been in the sector for a number of years. Yep. And do you see anything um, segmented within that generalist interest? Is it just gold mining companies? Is it, is it just the top tier big names that people are coming back to? Or is it some of the um, more interesting intermediates or close production plays where the generalists might think they'll take their, they'll, they'll take an opportunity there? Well, I, I think by their nature, it's hard enough to kind of get up to speed on a company quickly, but if you have to get up to speed on a commodity at the same time and understand the dynamics of that commodity, it, it's a harder sell. So obviously gold and copper are the sort of easiest uh, commodities, I think, for, for generalists to get their heads around, and that's where they're going to gravitate towards um but uh yeah look um, uh, i i i think they'll, they'll take into account scale and liquidity as well like like everyone else has been forced to do due to fund mandates in in the last few years yep certainly but i think i mean, I mean in terms of gold mining i think we, we we can come on to that because i think that's probably one of the questions that you'll ask later on but there isn't a huge universe as you know in london 
generally for mining, but but specifically in the in the the precious metal space as well. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, we can touch on that and some of the interesting um, activity that's been going on in London in recently. Um, keeping it on broad themes, just quickly, um, Jessica, you raised a point around um, sentiment for the sort of a, a green agenda or the green a greener narrative, um, and I just wanted to touch on um, how, how you see that developing in the next in the near term, um, how that's affecting. Um, positions in, in metals and mining projects, but also, you know, do you think this Biden presidency might lean towards an, uh, a shift in energy policy in the US? And is that um, a huge factor towards that theme as well? So to answer your last question first, um, and, and not being in the US, so obviously not being as close to it, but um, Certainly, I think there is a view that if Biden had, wins the presidency, there will be a, a, a tilt towards, you know, not exactly something as big as the EU Green Deal, but something like that. Um, of course, it depends, you know, what the rest of the government looks like and, and what he can get through. But I think, you know, if the US just inflects in that direction a little bit, it is a big deal. It is a big market with a lot of resources, a lot of demand for energy. And so it, it matters a lot. It would make Europe nervous, uh, depending on how quickly people believe the US can ramp up, which they can always do very, very quickly on the, on the green side. Um, and it would make China nervous too. And so right now, you know, you've got European EVs, you've got China EVs, we've got renewable projects, we've got hydrogen that's coming up. And everyone thought this was an EU China thing. With the Biden election, all of a sudden, you've got another very, very big player in the world that could be joining this um, and innovating. And so it's very, very exciting. And so I think in the near term, we will still continue to see a lot of excitement around green projects, especially early stage. You know, the only thing I would Say is that some of these projects that we are seeing come across our desk are very much hinging, you know, hanging their hat, as Charles would say, on there's going to be tariffs and therefore, you know, we want local supply chains and therefore, um, and we don't quite buy that economic argument because it's, it's still a global, you know, industry after all. So that's one thing that we are very careful about, but absolutely, if, if the US really does pivot in that direction and we start seeing some suggestions of policy that can make a difference, it will move very, very quickly and, and be very, very exciting sooner than, than I think most people were expecting. Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, Charles, uh, I'll turn to you because I believe you're, 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 you live in New York or you're, based, you're certainly based yeah. there. Um, what's, the, what's the view from stateside? Um, and are there any commodities within that? I know you obviously cover copper um, and look at copper um, uh, very much. So it's a, it's a very interesting conversation and, and Jessica clearly addressed that the, the, the big um, item is, does the US swing in the right direction? And I'm gonna make the argument that this is not so much government driven <clears throat> policies anymore. Um, it's now driven by the people of the, of the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. The average consumer in this country um, is clearly talking about green. Um, no, no matter your political affiliation, I think that 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 shift has occurred. Um, anything the government can do and will do will add to the the speed and the acceleration of that. But without this, without a question, this trend is in place, and it's owned by the people. Um, I think that's <clears throat> excuse me. That, I think that's a very critical distinction to make now relative to four years, maybe five years ago, where it was very much you know, still a government incentive policy. You know, I think back to the mid 2000s when <clears throat> Tesla sort of became a better known company. You know, Tesla survived for many reasons, but one of the reasons were government uh, help or government subsidies or uh, tax breaks. Um, today, a lot of those uh, technologies are because of government um, subsidies over the last 10 years have now become profitable and sustainable. And because of that, that can be rolled out more frequently. <clears throat> you know, and I, I judge that for many reasons, many ways, but just from where I live and I drive and I live about an hour outside of New York City. 
and I look at the houses where I live and the, the streets where I live and the number of um, solar panels that's on houses and the number of electric vehicles that's around, the number of charging stations. And I look at what people are talking about, just, you know, the average conversation is a very, very green at the moment. So I, I'll, I'll say it's owned by the people and this, this train is not going to get stopped, which is a very positive. The second thing I'll add to it is that <clears throat> the mining companies have clearly joined this conversation. And that's a very important thing from many, many angles. First angle is, again, this train's not going to stop. The second um, reason why it's important that joined it is if you look at from a capital allocation point of view, that is the number one question we are getting. What is ESG? What is E specifically going on in the mining world as it relates to being green? Um, I think the biggest risk for the um, the OEMs, whether it's a battery manufacturer or the car producer at the end of the day, is their carbon footprint down the supply chain, so down to the lithium slash cobalt producer. And I think that's the next thing that a lot of people is going to start paying attention on. And I actually think it's the biggest risk for the OEM, OEM manufacturers is that they get penalized because their carbon footprint down the supply chain in a perceived green product that they make is not as green as what people think it is. <clears throat> the other thing I'll add to it um, is, is regional um, exposure, regional supply of these green metals. So President Trump over the last four years did bring through a very important um, policy. It's called the strategic metals policy. And the strategic metals includes things such as platinum and cobalt and lithium and rare earths and a whole range of other things. And it's effectively a strategic metal policy that um, promotes domestic production of, call it greener metals for lack of a better word, right? And there's many companies, both in private and public <clears throat> positions, that I'm having conversations with where not only funding is made very uh, affordable to them via, via the government, but more importantly is um, red tape from <clears throat> approving environmental um, guidelines or getting wa water permits or whatever the permit might be is clearly fast-tracked for these people, uh, for these mining companies. And I, and I think there's a lot of things going on at the moment that is making this a very exciting space. Outside of this, where's, where, where's demand going to go to regarding electric vehicles and things like that? So, um, and I'll, I'll end with the following. As a, as a fund, and, and Kaylee alluded to this earlier, just to give you an idea, uh, <clears throat> our, our fund historically used to be about 50% traditional energy. That's now down to about 12% traditional energy. And the displacement of that effectively has all gone into greener metal equities. So as a fund, we've turned our, 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 our direction and where we're investing, what we like, based on what we're seeing is a very strong grass. It's not even a grassroots movement. It's a very strong movement in the US occurring Years after Europe, without a question, years after many other countries, but clearly it's taking place and it's going to be a strong driver. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and are you taking a global view on this? Um, you mentioned the OR Act and the US Act. Is, is, that, is that a specific focus for you now, sort of US domestic um, developments or, or exploration? Um, or do you still take a global view? As Jessica mentioned before, it's, it's they, they take a very global view despite this demand for sustainable supply chains or shorter supply chains, if you like, more localized? Sure. From an investment point of view, we take a global view without a question. Um, but I think Jessica made the point very well is that if the US really gets behind this, it changes the dynamic of this entire thematic theme. And so um, although we are instrumental and we do get involved in domestic specific companies, um, we clearly have a very global view. Again, it goes back to, you know, as an investor, where's my value? What unlocks my value? And normally your domestic or your geographical location is not necessarily something that unlocks that for you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something about Tesla before, and I'm thinking of like some of the quotes mm -hmm. from Elon Musk. Some of them we can take more seriously than others, of course. But this idea of uh, OEMs getting more involved or owning more of or entirely value chain and then also you know oems getting into mining do you think there's a disconnect between the oems uh, uh 
what, what they appreciate from the mining companies. Um, do you think they want this more sustainable nickel, more sustainable uh, lithium quicker? But actually, the, the 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 whole process needs a lot more time to improve on its uh, sustainable uh, credentials. It's a it's a difficult question. <clears throat> Excuse me, difficult question you ask me. Um, without a question, everybody in that supply chain wants a greener, lower carbon footprint, better social, um, better governance. Uh, conversation. Everybody wants that. Um, I mean, you got to imagine somebody like Ford and their <clears throat> investors are clearly asking them, where are they going to get the cobalt slash lithium slash nickel from? And what does that look like? Um, you know, I've had interesting conversations over the last couple of days with what I'm going to call greener metal producers. And within that conversation, there's a clear split between people arguing that OEMs will eventually end up owning these mining companies because they can control their carbon footprint better or they have more control of it or more insight onto it. And there's a very clear argument of saying, we will be independent miners because um, the OEMs doesn't want to get involved in that. So it's clearly split between between that those two, the, those two sides. Yeah, interesting. Okay, great. Uh, Kayla, do you, do you have a view on this? Um... Uh, this integration of the supply chain or, or, or the activities going on with OEMs and EVs um, that are impacting the sustainable credentials of some of the battery materials or the uh, technology materials um, that mining companies are, are looking for. Yeah, well, I think I think the trend is only going to accelerate. Um, you know, we we just have to remember that the world's been put on pause for the best part of a year. Um, so if, if the virus hadn't happened, my goodness, <laughs> this this message would have been banging on the door much, much harder. So I fully expect it to come back with a vengeance uh, next year. And woe betide anybody that's that's not prepared for it, quite frankly. So right down from the little guys to the big guys and all the way through the chain, you know, everybody's got to get on board with this um in full force and be prepared and we're all learning you know it's it's a new area for all of us um understanding what all the elements of esg is what actual sustainability means the circular economy means um what scope two three emissions mean you know it it's all relatively new but we've got to learn quick and we're, we're all doing our best because we know what's coming um the message is absolutely loud and clear we see it in the flow of our funds i mean anecdotally i did some work experience for my uh, daughter's school earlier this year um hoping that it was going to be a an interview on career development and it turned into an interrogation in mining <laughs> um, so this is a, a 14 year old um telling me that mining is a, a dirty business <laughs> so that's the perception uh, and it's all the way through the, the planet. So we, we've, we've got to um, understand exactly what everything is, exact, understand how to measure it, um, and, and understand, um, well, inform clients that they know where they're, what, what exactly they're putting their money is and what risks are involved. So, yes, you know, I think the fact that Tesla is... Uh, to case in point, you know, is, is about this market cap is about the size of all, all its peers added together. It tells you everything you need to know, quite frankly. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Okay, well, we strafed into some of the ESG uh, trends there, and I wanted to uh, sort of conclude our discussion on that point. So we'll, we'll definitely come back to some of those very good points uh, raised there in a bit. Um, just wanted to come back to um, value the value investing approach uh, of everyone at the moment, and you know, companies. We've said that uh, are obviously in good health. They've performed well um, comparatively to the last cycle. Um, um, what does what what does everyone think of valuations at the moment? Are they sort of where they need to be? Is it a bit sporadic? Um, obviously, there's a gold bull going on at the moment. Um, are we seeing a case where perhaps if you're an ASX listed company, you're you're, you're slightly inflated with the, with the competition, the noise that's on that marketplace? Um, uh, um, how do, how do our, how does the panel see valuations at the moment? I'll kick Bailey. off your line. Um, 
Yeah, I mean they're not they're not they're not stretched by most in most cases, but there's certainly there's there's not not particular uh, cheapness around them. There's not a huge amount of value around, you know, and I, I think that's a broader reflection of the market in general that that growth has been winning over value for quite some time. Um, I think the the issue, the main, the biggest issue we have is the markets are just so damn fast, quite frankly. So only, you know, especially more applicable perhaps for this forum, you know, the smaller companies that put a drill hole or, or out and then before you know it, the, the market's pricing in a, a resource, a mine <laughs> and cash flows. Um, so it, 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 is, it is hard. It, it is hard to deal with that. It's hard to keep up with that. I think on the on the whole, and Jessica alluded to this earlier, there are pockets of things around. We have some seen some rotation from areas, some areas of value to others. But I think the things that seem to be winning out, you know, is demonstration of cash over everything else. You know, showing that companies can generate free cash flow. Yes, give give a portion of that back to um, to shareholders, uh, and perhaps maintain discipline you know that that's that's the sort of things that we we think the market will be continue to be responsive for so you know those sort of valuation trends i suspect will continue yep certainly um child do you put um uh, a priority on companies returning cash to shareholders um at the moment um and, and what's your view on sort of value investing approach to this particular um point in the market i, I think kelly um and i agree on a lot of a lot of the issues regarding valuations and stuff um i think that the key thing is that um again for companies that's got the strong cash flow generation strong balance sheets that that return of capital um needs to be maintained um you know there's a very well-known investor in the united states a couple of weeks ago uh, talked about rio tinto and what an incredible value rio tinto is for a number of reasons, but he highlighted the fact of their dividend policies and the dividend yield as being of X and it's less than the dividend yield of X was higher than its EV EBITDA uh, valuation number. So it's clearly getting um, it, it getting very little attention, but it's getting attention more now than a year ago, let me put it that way to you. Um, so I think it's important that that um, um, uh, strictness or that um, uh, uh, yeah, there's the strictness to making sure we've got a healthy balance sheet uh, is maintained. I think that the interesting question 12 months out from now, maybe even less, well, actually going to be less is when a lot of the, the larger companies have got cash on their balance sheets, no more debt. Are they going to then you're going to be called lazy balance sheets? And what, are, what is the management going to do then? Um, do they then all of a sudden, you know, leverage themselves up? Right. Do we go back to a period where we've got a very high debt levels? That's not what I want to see. Um, I definitely don't want to see a lazy balance sheet either. So what does it really mean for me that in the next 12 months, we need to get a lot more money coming back to shareholders? And I think you need to get that, that indication that they're going to continue to create value by returning cash to shareholders because they just don't have a better place to put it. We need to have that entrenched. Because if you really think back, even from 2000 to 2010, when the stocks really did well, there was a lot of value destruction that took place because they just threw good money onto bad projects just so they can grow their supply base because demand was just growing so fast. And I think a lot of that is, is normalized now more. So I clearly want to see that. Um, but then again, for the companies, that's companies, project specific development companies and exploration companies, they obviously don't have that luxury. And so for them, again, it's, do I have a good project? What is my NPVs and that type of stuff is what I'm looking, looking towards. Yep. Can I ask a um, question, Adam? Please, yeah. I was, I was actually going to ask Charlene and Kaylee and, and Ross this because, you know, I don't look at the large diversified miners and, and these big cap names as closely anymore. And so to your point, 12 months from now, these guys are going to have amazing balance sheets. They're still going to have very low cost operations and, and continue to run. Do they become like utilities, like some of the, you know, some of the energy names are starting just to become these late stage utility type things? Do you think the sector gets there in some way? And it, and then it's just a yield play <laughs> at that point. Oh, I, I don't think it's in most mining companies' natures to become annuities. 
Um, I think the cash will burn a hole in people's pockets and they'll they'll be forced to do something, whether that's returning it to shareholders um, or looking more at M&A because they're in a healthier position to do so, or putting more money into the ground, which is something that we've just not seen for a long period of time. And you might see that they start to pick up more exploration plays as well, which will add more value into the sector, which was a point I was going to make as well in terms of where valuations are at the moment. Um, so I, I, I don't... I mean, there's a couple of examples out there that our client, Central Asia Metals, who, who pays out a very healthy dividend yield and has been very attractive for a lot of um, UK generalist institutional investors and income funds. But I think that's probably a, an exception in the sector rather than the, the uh, where, where we're going to go in the future. I think so. I think the other point is some of the some of the well, well, it's, uh, uh, let's, let's start again. It's it's a, mess, a matter of messaging. So a lot of the big miners are putting a lot of effort into the technology piece and the, and the sustainability piece, um, some better than others. But I think that's probably where the next sort of leg of value will come from a lot of them if they get that right. You, you know, we all know that the industry is very long dated, so it's, it's a massive challenge to get that adopted. But I, I think that's where the next excitement sort of lays in, let's call it three to five years, something like that. Yep. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, just uh, coming back to one of the questions I had around this cash flow and the idea of uh, putting that back into exploration, um, which was touched on as well. Um, does, does, does it look like that, that, that that's going to be uh, something on the horizon uh, for, for most companies looking to replace mine ounces? Um, Kaylee, you mentioned expiration earlier, seeing more encouraging signs than perhaps um, a couple of years ago. Um, do you see that that's going to be higher up on the larger companies' uh, agendas to put more capital back into uh, expiration? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a very interesting dynamic. But if you if you look up and in gold industry in particular, if you look up and down the spectrum, you know, we've gone from sort of three year mine plans to five year mine plans. And now the big guys are sort of talking 10 year mine plans. So there is a look a, a, a look to create a sustainable business much further out. And for obviously for that, you need exploration um, and their capacity constrained to be able to do that. So they're quite happy to take stakes in junior companies and let them take the high risk, high reward part of the business. So I think that that's one trend that will definitely keep continuing. Um, and I think there will be, there, there's not unlimited funding for, you know, junior exploration companies, but there are, there is definite interest. So I think if they can behave, you know, as good citizens and, and perhaps not repeat sins of the past, like some other, uh, some, some exploration companies or junior companies have done, um, I, I think that's an area that will continue to do very well. It's, it's extremely hot at the moment. Um, there's clearly a, a need for exploration. Um, I think what I think it's slightly two tiered in that there's sort of quality in the rest. So you know there there is a lot of let's call it exploration noise. You know if we're looking at I don't know gold, for example, do we need another gram? one gram per ton, 100,000 ounce gold mine in Canada. I, I'm not so sure, you know, there's plenty of those knocking around all over the world, but something world-class, something fantastic grade, or, you know, in a good jurisdiction or not, uh, I think that that kind of thing is gonna remain of massive interest to the investor community in general. Yeah, um, with that then, do you see m a sort of cooling off or not not necessarily picking up too much uh, as we go into next year then? Yeah, I think that's the question on all our lips, really. Um, I mean, secretly, I'd say, uh, good God, I hope not. Um, in, in a lot of regards, we don't, I don't think we need, uh, I, I think there's a, there's a bit of a, in, and I'm talking mainly to gold here, there's definitely a fight for relevance. Uh, and size so um that's going to be a bit of an issue but i don't think putting a you know three juniors together to make something bigger with no synergies i think is the way to go so yes i see m a for quality projects yes i see m a for where there's absolutely real synergies involved 
there'll probably there will no doubt be some MA where there's no synergies and and no rationale at all because that's our industry um, sadly but um i I, th I hope i hope and i believe that the majority of the MA will actually be in of good standing yeah um, Jessica, do you do you have a stance on what, what you hope for M and A for next year? You know, gold's sort of on the up, and you mentioned there weren't too many opportunities from, for private equity with distressed assets, for instance, in the pandemic fallout. Um, might this be a good time that private equity are thinking about perhaps exiting some of their earlier positions and then positioning in some of the um, other 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 projects um, that are in a lower point in the commodity cycle? Do you have a, a take on that? Um, so, you know, we're always happy to exit if someone's willing to, to pay, pay up for it. Um, I don't think that's really um, a, a question, but, you know, at the same time, we do, we do take um, the ESG value add of our projects very seriously as well. And so, you know, while you can look at something and just you know, put a dollar value in it. At, at the same time, we want these projects to be sustainable and continue to be sustainable and, and continue to be run by someone who, who cares about it. So that matters a lot as well in terms of projects that, that we might be holding um, already in our portfolio. Uh, we want to make sure that they're, they're developed well. And so that's a huge part of our due diligence is, is always going through and seeing what are the ESG value add opportunities, not just the risks, but what are the opportunities as well. So um, that's one side of it. Gold is interesting, uh, you know, because as, as Kaylee said, typically they, they come with like a three to five year mind plan. And that's very difficult to sit there uh, and, and say that that's great. The, the other issue that I've got with gold, um, generally speaking, is you know, from a commodity price perspective, it's, yes, it's a safe haven, but you've also got other emerging asset classes that are starting to come in and compete with it. And so that's one thing that won't necessarily impact the gold price tomorrow, but it's something that we need to think about as a multi-year investor, because we're looking at three to five years when we, when we look at these projects. And so, you know, the very easy one to think about is cryptocurrency, because they're kind of this counter fiat government controlled money idea. Um, but you've also got tokenization of other hard and real assets that are coming into the market over the next, call it five years, probably, um, in a more mainstream way. And so, you know, that's also another way for, for investors to, to get exposure to, to safe havens and to real assets and hard assets and the things that people want. So that's when we think about gold, yes, we can, you know, of course, we can, we can trade the price and we can trade the equities probably not as well as Cheryl and Kaylee do, but uh, you know, we can do that. But when we think about the longer term for something like gold, we also have to think about what the other competing assets um, are that are out there and, and those types of opportunities. Um, yeah, and then in terms of, sorry, and then in terms of the other sorry. commodities, yeah, absolutely. Green commodities, copper, uh, lithium, cobalt, nickel, um, potentially some other interesting new materials that, that are coming up. They're all very, very interesting to us. It's just a matter of finding, finding the right project and asset. Certainly. Um, absolutely. Um, Ross, could I, uh, could I bring you in here? We've sort of moved on to everyone's giving their view, views on gold and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious we've got that as one of the topics that we're going to address. Um, so uh, what, what's your take on what's going on in the gold space right now? Do you see M&A potentially picking up and then perhaps could we talk as a second question about um, what's going on in the London market? There's been some interesting activity there that I know Pill Hunt have obviously been involved in there um, and some increased institutional appetite for uh, exposure to gold mining companies. So on the m and side, um, I mean, I think, to be honest, I, I think m and actually been a little bit subdued. Maybe I'm too focused on London. It's too small of a sample size for um, and, and others will have different views, but I think the pandemic's hampered um, M&A in, in two kind of key ways. One, uh, the ability to travel and undertake technical due diligence, um, which obviously would, would impact private equity investment as well, which, I, and again, I think that's been subdued. And then two, and, and almost more importantly, um, just the ability for management teams to, to sit down over a bottle of wine and get to know if, 
if that's a, a team that you can work with and, and go forward with. I think that's that's kind of key to any transaction. And, and obviously people are, are hindered in being able to do that. So um, my view is that there's actually going to be a bit of a backlog um, in terms of deals that have been in the running companies that have been speaking to each other and either need to kind of go through that technical DD process or go and have a beer together to make sure that they, 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 they can be friends in the future. Um, so I think, I think we will see more. I think we'll see more private equity investments as well when we come into 2021 and travel restrictions are lifted because I think, um, I'm sure everyone's been very busy on desktop analysis in the last year. Um, and then in terms of the, the London listings, like, I mean, I think it's, uh, I don't think there's anything specific that the, the listings that we've um, uh, undertaken, like uh, Yamana Gold and, and Wheat and Precious Metals, other than the fact that, that the London market has a big hole for precious metals companies, particularly larger, liquid, diversified um, companies with assets in, in what I, I would kind of broadly term good jurisdictions. Um, and I think um, uh, Kaylee and Charles are kind of spoiled for choice being able to invest across Toronto and, and Australia. But there's a lot of generalist fund managers in the UK who, whose mandates preclude that. And it gives them the opportunity to, to, to come into that space. So um, I think that should be welcomed. And I think um, those guys didn't have a huge amount of choice um, earlier in the year when the gold, gold price was, was rallying. So. Um, I think it's positive that, that other companies are coming to London. I yeah. think generally we have we have quite a small universe of mining companies relative to those two other jurisdictions and and anything that we can do to to increase the, the number of quality companies and the choice for investors here is positive. Yeah. Um, and you so you see it as potentially a trend next year, more listings. Um and I notice um Endeavor um and Taranga um uh, looking at acquisition and potentially a London listing of that. Um, do, you, do you think AIM and LSE are going to get more companies, more quality, slightly later stage or you near know, producing assets coming in? Look, I, th I think companies that are coming to London have to do so with a rationale for listening. I think Yamana and Wheaton absolutely have that because there's a hole in the market. But I don't think you can come um, without having the, 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 the investment case um, that investors are going to deem relevant. And obviously, without a liquidity event, um, it is 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 a... Uh, it's a hard slog for, for companies like that to, to generate liquidity on the London line and therefore make it worthwhile. What it does do is open up um, the, the investor universe uh, quite significantly, I think, to, to UK journalists. Um, Endeavour, I think, is really interesting because they, they've noted that they're going to move to a premium listing and, and aim for FTSE um, uh, indexation, which means that they, they, they're obviously going to have to pay, pass the liquidity thresholds that... Um, you need to, to do that. So um, I think there'll be more fireworks as far as, as they're concerned. Yep, certainly. Okay, great. Um, so just to finish up on gold then, um, as we've, we've touched on it on a number of points, do, do you see gold could be sort of a catalyst for a wider um, commodity bull run, uh, bull conditions? Um, seeing some valuations come down perhaps at the end of this year. Um, whether that's to do with uh, treasury um, uh, yields improving off the back of a vaccine, for instance. Um, do you think that the gold, gold bull run has a long way to run and will it drag other commodities along with it, like copper that we're seeing is having quite a good run? Uh, Ross, what's your view there? And we'll go around. Um, not, not really, no. Um, uh, I mean, I think that ultimately investors are kind of driven by the momentum in, in the commodity price and, and kind of, what's more in vogue. Um, uh, I, I don't think a positive gold, gold price necessarily correl correlates with a positive best, base metals or bulk prices, but I do think the environment we're in at the moment, you might see both occurring at the same time. But I don't think it's a case of one commodity dragging another. I think it just seems like we're in a, a fairly positive space um, across the board at the present time. Yeah, certainly. Okay, great. Um, we, we mentioned a lot of things around ESG so far, um, and we've covered a lot of uh, points on <clears throat> how important ESG is <clears throat> in creating the, the value of the company um, to shareholders. It, it, we really it, we could have put ESG as the first discussion point for this panel. Um, I just wanted to put it to to, to everyone. 
Um, do you feel that mining companies now know what to do for the ESG reporting standards? Um, and do you also feel that they're doing it to a level uh, that shareholders expect? Um, Jessica, you, can we start with you perhaps as a private equity view on that? Yeah, so I think, I think the answer is that um, nobody knows exactly what to do. Uh, the same way when you sort of do, you know, I think, I think we're getting there though. I think we're getting quite close. Um, not every company is obviously on the same level, but, but absolutely the, the one thing that we care about when we meet with companies and talk to them is they need to at least be educated especially the top level of management. This is not, you know, the sustainability officer answering our questions anymore. This needs to come from the CEO. Um, and they need to know what they need to do to get better. At least if they have identified the shortfalls and they know what they need to work towards, that to us is key because no, no company is, is absolutely perfect on this front. Um, and so that's what we care about. Obviously, things like measuring your carbon footprint is pretty simple at this point and it's just a matter of you know knowing where to look and, and being able to answer that question so measuring your carbon footprint so so important especially because this is quantifiable this is something that people can can check and measure against and start thinking about what does that mean in terms of um you know meeting our net zero targets or two degree targets all of that is coming together um and so there are some things that are fairly easy. I don't think every company is on the same level, um, but, but it's very important to at least have done the work, start a track record of doing the work, and then uh, know where your opportunities are and be able to really speak to that and, and how you're doing it. And that's, and that's what we look for. Yeah, excellent. Um, Charles, could I, could I come to you? Um, touched on quite a lot of things with the environmental side of things and sustainability we were talking about. Um, the greening uh, of, of society earlier. Um, but within ESG, uh, do you feel the companies are doing enough at the level that you want? And what what, what specifically do you ask of your uh, portfolio companies? So, I, you know, the way I look at it is, is, first of all, I think there's a significant improvement on what they are talking about relative to two years ago, or maybe even a year ago. And, you know, it, it's fascinating if you wind the clock back to 10 years ago, um, the only ESG slide we would talk about is health and safety, right? Um, and, and the point I'm making there is they have this data. It's not like, you, and so mining companies have the data and we as investors have been doing ESG forever because we've looked at health and safety and efficiencies and productivity in some way or another, sustainability. We've looked at that, right? reclamation of mines and where there was funding for reclamation of mines. We've been doing it for a long time. We've just never called it ESG. And secondly, we've just never brought it to the front of the slide deck. So companies have taken ESG from the back of the slide deck to the front of the slide deck, and I have to commend them on that. And I think they need to continue to do that. And they need to basically lead off with ESG for a sustainable period of time until the broader market realizes, but they are very well aware of ESG and what's going on in the world and, um, and things like that. The second point I'll make is we score companies on an ESG basis following is basically, are you improving? Are you transitioning? Are you rising or are you established? So that's sort of from the lower end to the higher end. And I'll be honest with you, majority of the companies in the mining world is either improving or transitioning still. And we need them to get to a rising or an established point of view. And I think Kelly said this earlier, some of them are further ahead than others. But the majority of the space is still improving. And, and the reason why, because they, they have sustainability reports, but they're not talking about it enough. So that's my encouraging words to them is talk more about it, put it in the front of your slide back. Um, I don't want to have, have to ask ESG questions and until today still, I have to ask it. I want to be told about ESG. We need that to, to be established. Yeah, I would agree with that, Carl, but I would just, I would just add that I, I think, um, there's definitely a job to be done on the, the part of the institutional investor, which I do think a lot of uh, investors are doing well now in terms of educating those companies, because there is still a degree of confusion in a lot of companies as to what they should be reporting. Um, and there's obviously a tendency for companies to kind of cherry pick the, the stuff that looks better than, than others. Um, but I think that definitely in terms of uh, investors like yourself and BlackRock and, and 91, where you have in-house ESG teams and you, you've you been sitting down with companies and running through how you you judge them, you assess them, what you want to see 
in sustainability reports, how you want the board to look. I think that's that's hugely positive, and we've seen more of that, which I think is encouraging as well. You know, Adam, maybe I can just add one thing to that to do the question, right? So this industry is an extracted extraction industry. Yes, I get that, right? But ESG is not just extraction. There's the whole community involvement. What do we do for the community? What do we do for our employees? Is the education? What do we do regarding governance and things like that? So the ESG conversation is way bigger than just we are taking something out of the ground. And I mean, the easy answer for I'm taking something out of the ground. Well, what do you do with that hole? What do you do with that hole once you're done with it, right? But companies, uh, sorry, investors are seeing mining companies as as destroying things versus, you know, they don't know about the hospitals that some companies are building. They don't know about the schools that companies are building. They, they don't know about the, the loans they're making to local employee or to local communities or employees. They don't know about the industries that they're building up. And companies need to come up and speak about what are they doing for other people and, and, and focus less on just, and get people to focus less on they just digging a hole. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a few questions sort of filter in around greenwashing or, or sort of mining being so extractive you can't get away from it. Um, and it harks back to a point that I heard uh, uh, in a previous podcast, sort of a get dirty to get clean type mentality. You know, there's a lot of, you know, mining is extractive, but um, there's a communicational battle perhaps from the, from the mining companies around sending the message about what their end product is creating or what these rare earths going into really important medical equipment that are quite a niche thing that people don't necessarily understand. Um, Kaylee, uh, could I come to you on the ESG factors um, just to conclude? Um, is there perhaps uh, something within E, S or G that you're not seeing enough of or would like to see more of uh, from the mining companies perhaps? Well, I mean, the two points I would make, I mean, we, we've got a, you know, we, we have our own stewardship team separate from the investment team and they're, they're enormous. So um, they, they deal with all kinds of companies across the world. Um, uh, and as I said earlier, we're still learning about it. But I, I think the first point I would make is that the, the standardization of metrics is absolutely key. And we just all need to work together to do that. I mean, it, it's doable. It's it's tough, as I said. We're still learning, but we've done we've done it with cost reporting. You know, there's the all in sustaining cost in the gold industry. What we need, we're at the end of the day, we're all simple idiots, really. So we we need a sheet <laughs> at the front of their pack which says these are the these are the five key metrics of ESG reporting, and everybody reports to those metrics, and then we can benchmark them, and then we can understand what they mean. It's, so it, it, it's a simple thing, but at the moment, what the industry is doing is a pretty good job. But one fantastic sustainability report, which is 200 pages thick, is entirely different from another sustainability report, which is 200 pages thick. And quite frankly, that's impossible for anybody in their right mind to go through and unpick. So that, I think that's the first point. We need standardization. The IE, um, ICMM in Canada was, was spearheading one um, element of that which I'd be keen for people to involve the second point I'd make was that w no one is uh, can escape this so just because you're a small junior company don't assume and you don't have funds and anything like don't assume you're uh, going to be um, shielded from this uh, you've still got to engage with all the ESG agencies MSCI sustainalytics you've got to talk to them you've got to look at your ratings you've got to see why there's might be a red flag on your register because sure as hell we'll pick up on it. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful it's trending in the, all the right directions. It just needs to be quicker and we need to all do our, make our best efforts as much as we can from all sides to make sure we demonstrate this is in fact a very good industry. Do you think just to, just to conclude then the, um, the cost of capital will, will reflect companies that do ESG better um, and, and, and in some respects the market will sort of bifurcate or just highlight the companies that do well and those companies will succeed. You would like, selection. Yeah, you would hope so, Adam. I mean, we, we've only seen it on the extreme ends of the case, you know, an environmental disaster and yes, you, your rating gets shot to bits and your credibility gets shot to bits, but we haven't really seen it in, and vice versa, you know, a good citizen there's, there are companies out there that report, you know, 
one listed on London that's extremely good at doing that. Um, what we haven't seen is sort of that bit in the middle, you know, and I think that's going to be the, 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 the challenge. Um, and we also haven't seen, you know, an ESG fund, let's call it, not outside of mining, whether that, what those sort of return metrics look like compared to, let's say, conventional funds, you know, does it, are the returns the same? Can you can you invest in a green fund and get the same return that you hope for from a conventional fund? We, we don't know. Again, that's still early days. But I would think, yes, I think if we get it right, if we get all the standardization right, then yes, we should see that premium rating. There's no reason why not. We've seen it in other, we've, we've seen it in all the other metrics. So why not in ESG? I mean, yeah. we have seen some of those loans, right, where the rate is linked to some measure of, of ESG KPI. So we are seeing them introduced at very formal bank loan levels. Um, and so it's a matter, I think, of, of getting some of on the private investor side um, along for that ride. And then, you know, it, hopefully, hopefully this will this will grow and, and become more important source of capital. So we'll see. Yes. Yeah, so I think yeah. point, Jessica, maybe we need an equity rating, like a debt rating, <laughs> an equity rating agency. Correct. Can I just ask a question, Kelly? How do you see... Um, Obviously, different mines, different types of mines in different jurisdictions are going to be naturally sort of laggards or winners if you just have a very simplistic sort of five box kind of uh, assessment. Uh, do you see there, therefore, uh, to almost Adam's question, like a bifurcation that isn't necessarily the fault of the company? It's more a move away from a certain jurisdiction or a certain style of mining, perhaps. Yeah, I think you're probably going to get that. And don't and don't get me wrong, Ross. The, these metrics are going to be far from perfect. We know yeah. that with the sustaining cost, you know, that's far from a perfect measure, and people report to it differently. Um, but it's a it's a it's a start. You know, I think we just need to get a good starting point. But yes, I think that it will highlight. It may highlight those some of those um unnatural risk elements but i don't think that's i don't think that's a bad thing you know because investors have to know they can they can look they're not i don't think anybody's too stupid to be able to say well we, on esg might be low on the one hand but the reward the reward metrics might be higher on the other you know the returns mm -hmm. might be higher on the other so i'm willing to take that bet i'm educated yeah. enough bet. i think it, transparency has got to win out over everything Absolutely. Excellent. Well, look, I, I, we, we could go on, um, but I think we've covered some excellent ground. It's been really informative, jumping around quite a lot of themes, but I hope that's given a great snapshot of where we are for our viewers and we've uh, we've reached an hour of discussion. So I'd just like to say thank you very much to our panel uh, for your time, to Jessica, Charles, Ross and Kaylee, and um, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.